video. Oh, angiolymphoid uh, hyperplasia with eosinophilia. I think I do have one of those. This is a very nice example from even low power, right? When you've seen this, you put this slide down, and the very first thing you think of is angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. The other name that's been proposed for this is epithelioid hemangioma. Now, in, uh, as we've progressed in our knowledge, there is a thought that there are probably kind of two different things here. There's probably a true neoplasm, ep epithelioid hemangioma, that often have a FOS, uh, or FOSB abnormalities. And then in the skin itself, there are probably things that are reactive, that have prominent vessels, lymphocytes, and eosinophils that probably are non-neoplastic. So there's, uh, the WHO goes into that a little bit, but I think there are a lot of overlap morphologically, and it's worth knowing um, the most classic examples that you see are like this, I think. And this is, you can see, this is a big damaged vessel. Usually an artery, the temporal artery or branches of the temporal artery are one of the most common places to see um, angiolymphoid hyperplasia or epithelioid hemangioma. And the tumor often arises in the, either in the lumen or in the wall of and expands out into the surrounding soft tissue, okay? Here you can see it's kind of a, a lobule of, of uh, cells pushing outward. The endothelial cells are very plump, je flu, and epithelioid, and so much so that sometimes they look more like nests of epithelioid cells rather than like vessels with lumens. Uh, when you do an immunostain for, um, for a vascular marker, it can sometimes help highlight that you really are dealing with vessels that are, are just with very plump, large endothelial cells. You can see like right, um, like here, see? That's a little lumen. It's just almost totally squeezed in uh, to obscurity by the uh, endothelial cells. Here's another right here, see? See how plump and large the endothelial cells are? Let me show you another area. This one, the lumen is more obvious, but you can see that the cells are large and push into the lumen. They will sometimes have endothelial vacuoles, which is a, a feature that's common among uh, endothelial cells that are plump and epithelioid, often have cytoplasmic vacuoles to some extent, okay? So we often learn about that in the context of epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, which have the blister cells, the little vacuole with the red cell in the lumen. But you can see vacuoles in epithelioid hemangioma, aka angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. You can see it in spindle cell hemangioma and others. The, um, most of these cases will have, in addition to the plump uh, vessels, the vessels are often arranged in little lobules and then there's a brisk inflammatory background with numerous lymphocytes, sometimes with germinal center formation, and that's what these large atypical guys here, many of these are probably germinal center B cells. You can also sometimes see reactive lymphocytes or immunoblasts, which will be CD30 positive. You tend to see those can be very prominent in the background of this tumor, uh, this process. And then eosinophils are usually present Sometimes numerous, there's lots of eosinophils here. But I want to point out that the, this is a really nice example because the lymphocyte inflammation and eosinophils are so abundant and robust, but some cases have very sparse inflammation and only scattered eosinophils. So recognize that not every case of angiolymphoid hyperplasia will look this lymphoid, okay? Sometimes they are much more subtle. Here's an area where the lumen of the damage, see, look at that muscular wall out there of the vessel. The lumen is, is, is you know, crushed, and you can see those same endothelial cells that are very plump and epithelioid lining the lumen. And there look the little, little vacuoles too. And um, an important point to recognize about these, there's a closer look too, is that they can sometimes have really cellular, very atypical appearance and particularly in one location where you don't want to make a mistake, in the penis. Angio uh, epithelial hemangioma of the penis can sometimes be very atypical and cellular and can lead to misdiagnosis as angiosarcoma with disastrous consequences. So before you diagnose an angiosarcoma of the penis, maybe get a consult on that one. I still feel very, very uncomfortable um, with that scenario because of obviously the very dramatic 
um, risk of what's going to happen to the patient with that kind of diagnosis. Numerous eosinophils here. And I've not used FOS um, or FOS B staining um, for these yet, but, uh, but I don't have uh, access to that yet in my lab. But it, FOS is supposed to be very helpful for some of these. Um, they don't always have it. And there's a kind of a growing number of, of uh, endothelial lesions that can have FOS or FOS B related um, fusions or um, immunostaining. So that's angiolymphoid hyperplasia. They can be one or sometimes multiple, often violaceous lesions. And again, the temple is a very good site for this. Okay? Yes? Oh, with Kimura disease. So that comes up a lot. And I, I struggle with Kimura's disease because I've never seen a real life case personally. I think of Kimura as having more of a lymph node predominance, right? Really arising within a lymph node. My understanding is they often have more neutrophils in the background, but I've not encountered Kimura, so I never have been able to really wrap my head around it. So that's a good question. I think of it as more of a hematopathology disease, and this as more of a soft tissue pathology, even though they do have some overlap. So there was a really good tweet about that a while ago, but I've clearly not memorized it. Um, Kyle Bradley is an excellent uh, hematopathologist who was a fellow at Emory when I was a fellow there, and he tweeted a, a nice chart about that. Uh, let's see if we can pull it up. Twitter will have all the answers for us, don't worry. 